that that if you will get the revelation of what I am sharing with you that is from the Word of God, then this message has potential to radically change. I would like to see that 5%, Brother Rick, go up drastically. And I'll tell you who has the power, the potential, and the responsibility for making that happen is his generation. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So I, I hope you will get the revelation of what I'm, I'm going to tell you about this morning. You know, few things in this life are more powerful than when God reveals something to you. When God drops something in your heart, it's undeniable. You, you can't argue with it. People can't talk it out of you. When God shows himself to be true, scientists can come up with all sorts of crazy mess and tell you came from monkeys and well, a primordial sludge or whatever. But if, if God has filled you with the Holy Ghost, then you can just tell him, shut up. I know God is real because he lives in my heart. It's undeniable. <laughs> Praise God for revelation. Revelation is powerful. And I know a lot of people that are here, you were raised in churches where you were taught, you know, that to be saved, all you have to do is just pray a prayer or think a thought in your mind or shake somebody's hand or something like that. But you, you've learned since then that the Bible says that you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus, the name of Yeshua. And for the Sunday morning people that don't know who I'm talking about, I like to say some Hebrew words every now and then. Yeshua is the Hebrew name of the Messiah, so I'm talking about Jesus, okay? Make sure everybody knows who I'm talking about this morning. But the Bible says that you need to be baptized in the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins, and be filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It's the Word of God. It doesn't matter what man says, it's what the book says. But you know, revelation is hindered by something called tradition. You don't have to be a theologian or have a great intellect or great faith. If you will read and study the Word of God with an open mind, God will speak to you. It's all there for the taking. All we have to do is read and obey. Sometimes the same scripture that you've read many times coupled with revelation, will just make it jump off the page in a way that you've never imagined. How many have experienced that before? We've all read the Bible through several times, and then sometime you read something, and it just like it's like the pages are glowing when it's coupled with revelation. And, and that's what I want to do this morning, hopefully God willing, is bring some things that you've read over before and, and maybe sprinkle a little revelation on it, praise the Lord. I want to start off in a scripture. Uh, thank you, Sister Sherry, for your help. I'm going to be depending heavily on you this morning. Uh, go ahead and give me Luke 10, 18, please. First scripture it says, Yeshua said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, most people hear that, and they believe that this is a reference to the beginning of time when there was a war in heaven, when the devil was cast down, and a third of the angels, and all that kind of stuff. Now, that if that's the way you've read that scripture and understood it, that is very powerful in and of itself. Because if you understand that, then you, you get the revelation that God, Yahweh, and Satan, the devil, are not equals. They are not equal opposites, as Pastor has talked about lately. The devil is just an angel. He can only be at one place at, at a time. He's not omnipresent. He's no match for God. And you can get that revelation just by that understanding of that scripture. You can understand that through God, we have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear at all. However, I want to say that that is not what this scripture is talking about. The true understanding of this scripture right here is even more powerful than that. In the beginning of the chapter, Yeshua sent out 70 disciples. He sent them out in groups of two by two, and he gave them a mission, Mission Impossible. He said, I've got four jobs for you guys. Number one, heal the sick. Number two, raise the dead. Number three, cleanse the lepers. And number four, drive out demons. How'd you like to get that mission? Praise the Lord. I was thinking of an example of this, and wherever Tiffany is, I was thinking about like somebody handing Clay a, a Nerf gun and saying, use this. You know, you don't get handed that kind of power. I could see him in church during service blasting people. That's what I thought about when I thought about that scripture. When God drops that kind of power in your lap, you don't sit on it. Amen? They, these 70 guys, they took their mission so seriously. They did what we sing about when we say, going up to the high place. They tore the devil's kingdom down is what they actually did. In fact, put up uh, verse 17 for me. It says, the 70 came back jubilant 
Lord, they said, with your power, even the demons submit to us. Yeshua said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Remember, I have given you authority so you can trample down snakes and scorpions, indeed, all the enemy's forces, and you will remain completely unharmed. See, this scripture isn't about God casting the enemy out of heaven. This scripture is about 70 people with unity, a made-up mind, obedient believers who literally walked up to the prince of the power of the air and jerked him out of his chair and cast him down. Now, what that tells me is that it doesn't take intervention of El Shaddai. God Almighty doesn't have to get involved to cast the devil down. He has given you, he has given me the authority to do it. It doesn't even take all the people that are here this morning. This church alone is, has the power to tear the devil's kingdom down. That is a lot more powerful to me. Amen. This wasn't speaking about something in the past. This was something the people of God did through God's power. Amen. Praise God. That, that's so much more powerful. You see that a scripture that maybe you have cruised over in the past, coupled with a little bit of revelation, suddenly becomes something else entirely. And God willing, that's what I'm going to do this morning. So let's get into the text. I was preaching already, but, you know, we have text now. Praise the Lord. So let's go to Isaiah 53. We're going to read verses 6 through 8, and um, I, I like to read from the, the CJB translation of the Bible, so if it's a little different for you, I'll try to give you some words here. It says, We all like sheep went astray. We turned each one to his own, yet Adonai, Lord, God laid on him the guilt of all of us. Though mistreated, he was submissive. He did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to be slaughtered, like a sheep silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. Verse 8, after forcible arrest and sentencing, he was taken away, and none of his generation protested his being cut off from the land of the living for the crimes of my people who deserve the punishment themselves. Now, Isaiah 53, this is very familiar to a lot of you. This is referred to as the suffering servant chapter. Now, even to this day, this, this scripture always, always was and remains a tough chapter for the Jews who do not acknowledge that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. You, you read this, and it's kind of like somebody describing an animal to you that uh, is in the water, has feathers and quacks, but it's not a duck. It just don't work. It's what the scripture is talking about. Even, but here's the thing, even the Jewish believers in the first century, even those closest to our Messiah, they were not looking for a suffering servant. They were looking for the conquering king version of the Messiah, the one we read about in Zechariah that talks about when he lands on the Mount of Olives, it splits in two, he's riding a, a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth, boom, you know, that's what they were looking for, the conquering king. Uh, but the, the truth of it is, Yeshua is the conquering king, but he is also the suffering servant. He is the one man who will accomplish all those things. If you want to know what the disciples, the apostles, the first century church was looking for, they were looking for Superman. All you have to do is, is go see Superman in the theaters to find out exactly what they were looking for. There, there were so many parallels. I watched this last week with Dad, and I was thinking, man, they are trying to make Superman Jesus. There are so many parallels. I didn't know this, but Superman actually came from a couple of Jews, a guy named uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. And uh, it, it was really their idea of what the Messiah would be. He's going to come and deliver everybody. And if uh, there are any Superman fans in the house, I don't know. You may have heard that his name was Kal-El on Krypton. Kal-El is Hebrew. It means the voice of God. They actually set him up to be a messenger from heaven. That's crazy. Now, all this stuff is true and biblical that Yeshua would be the suffering servant. He would be the conquering king. They just didn't realize he was going to do part of it in the beginning and come back and do part of it at the end. And, and this is a problem because sometimes people get something in their mind. They think it's going to play out this way. They, they get this idea in their head, this concept of how things have to be, and then even when facts come along, they, they can't listen to that because the tradition or the picture in their mind is just so seared in their mind that they can't see anything else. And I want to share with you a personal story of, uh, of this happening. Now, Lauren and I, praise God, have been married for 10 years. 
and going strong. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of that because that's a pretty rare thing these days. But we went on a, a cruise for our 10-year anniversary, and we were eating lunch uh, during the cruise, and there was a very talkative lady our age next to us, and I, I think she looked over and, and saw the baby and started asking us about, you know, uh, congratulating us and things like that. And, and I really, even to this day right now, I don't remember I guess this is just what happens when Holy Ghost people, you know, start talking to strangers. Somehow it went from baby to, to God and the Bible and the Holy Ghost. It just happened. I don't remember how we went there, but we did. Um, but this girl, she started talking to us about this certain TV preacher. This is, we were talking about God and the Holy Ghost, and she wanted to talk about TV preacher, man. She, she, gives her, she gives us her testimony, and she says that she was down in the dumps and depressed, and life was going bad, and, and this man came along, and he picked her up out of the miry clay and set her feet on a rock to stay. She started preaching to us about this TV preacher. Now, it really, it doesn't matter, you know, who this, who this was. I don't want to call this guy out or anything because that's not important. But I don't know what you are laughing about. So it's really uncomfortable for me. I see something in the reflection here. I don't know what's going on behind me. Uh, it was really uncomfortable listening to, to this woman talk about this man and elevate him to, to a pedestal up there with God. I mean, it was, it was very awkward. We're cringing while we're listening to her. And my normally quiet and unopinionated uh, wife, that's a joke, <laughs> chimed in and decided to give her opinion on this motivational speaker. She said that, Lauren said, you know, he, he is an excellent speaker. He has some positive and, and encouraging messages to share with people about how to live a happy life and that has nothing to do with preaching. That's not what, yeah, fluffy stuff. I, I sent Pastor Travis a text message. If y'all watched the webcast, he absolutely destroyed it uh, at, at the, the, uh, the chorus. Yeah, it was good. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I sent him a text and told him that, that Pastor Olstein wanted his, he called and he wanted his sermon notes back. You know, all the, like, cotton candy, fluffy stuff. So this girl was shocked that another Christian couple didn't worship this man. Uh, she started telling us about her past, her past. She told us that I grew up in religion. It was oppressive. It was legalistic. I was in bondage. These people that I grew up with, they had so many rules and restrictions. They didn't even know that God was three separate persons. Help us, Lord. I laughed myself, of course. Uh, and in the process, I discovered that words hold power over people. And I, I was so happy because I knew this was coming up, uh, Travis, when you talked about this last Sunday. We, remember when Pastor told the story, talked about the preacher reading a scripture and saying, let it walk and let it fly and let it run. And then when he said money, it was like an a, a oppressive spirit came into the room. I, I talked about the power of words uh, many months ago. That was a message that I, I shared. But, you know, I see that in... Um, in politics, if you ever listen to talk radio or you watch the talking heads on TV, you will see that two people can be going at it from, from different sides of the aisle and, and take your topic, homosexual marriage, for instance. I, I'll break the law any, any day of the week. If they tell us we can't preach what's in the Word of God, forget the government. Got to preach the Word. Got to preach the Word. So you'll see, you'll see a, a conservative guy up here and and he's given all the statistics in the world about why gay marriage, homosexual marriage is, take, take morality out of the equation. The facts simply say that children who are raised in a home with a mother and a father are going to do better in school. They're less likely to wind up in jail. The list goes on and on and on. And then the liberal on the other side, all they can do is say, you're a bigot. That's it. There's no facts. There's no argument. There's no reasoning behind it. You're a bigot. And when, when that word gets tossed, there, tossed out, it, it's amazing the impact of that word. It's like it doesn't matter what the facts say. It doesn't matter what's right and wrong. You just lost the debate, man, because you're a bigot. It's amazing. And, and we watch that stuff and we think, that's so ridiculous. All you can do is drop names on somebody because you have no argument. But I had a, a revelation, an epiphany. And that is that we do the same thing in the church. The church world in general I actually saw a post on Facebook by my buddy uh, John Mitchell, he said that everything that Christians don't like, they call it legalism. And I started thinking about that, and I started thinking that, you know, that has the same effect as calling someone a bigot. You got the Baptists, 
Uh, I guess I'll just drop a bunch of names. Praise the Lord. It's going to be true. You got the Baptists calling the apostolics legalistic because we say you can't be saved unless you're immersed in water in the name of Jesus. We got the apostolics saying that the holiness people are legalistic because the women can't wear makeup and red and short sleeves and whatever their rules are. And then the holiness people say the Catholics are legalistic because they got the Pope and all these man-made traditions, you know, swinging the incense as they go through the building and all this. And then the Catholics say that the Seventh-day Adventists are legalistic because they believe in keeping the Sabbath day. Everybody thinks everybody else is legalistic because they aren't doing it the way we think they should be doing it. And I say, shame on all of us for being so arrogant to believe that we are the only ones doing anything right. We're all doing the best we can with what we got. Most of us here didn't have all the revelation we have today a while back, so let's stop blasting everybody and, and just crushing everything and call it legalistic if we don't like it or understand it, but let's talk about it. I find that people are, you know, scared to talk about anything because they don't want to get into bondage. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, side note, praise the Lord. What does the scripture say about that particular topic, about bondage and, and yokes and things like that? Well, you know, all throughout the New Testament, Paul is constantly telling us that we are slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it in the Bible? He says it all over the place. You know, Yeshua himself said that a slave is not greater than his master. He said, if they persecuted me, guess what? They're going to persecute you. That's right. He also said that whoever practices sin is a slave to sin. The truth is we are all under some kind of yoke. I know that makes some people bristle up and they say, wait a minute, no, <clears throat> I'm free. I'm free to do whatever I want to do. But Jesus said no man can serve two masters, but he will serve one. He's going to either love the one and hate the other or cleave to the first and shun the second. You're going to have to serve somebody. So let's, let's take a look at some scripture here. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28. Uh, sorry, Matthew 11 verse 28. Everybody loves 28, but I want to read 29 and 30 along with it. Yeshua speaking, he said, Come to me, all of you who are struggling and burdened, and I will give you rest. That sounds good, but let's keep going. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I can deal with that kind of bondage. Praise the Lord. Uh, I think the men's group used to sing a song, You're Gonna Have to Serve Somebody. And uh, that's one of the few songs that I actually like and don't have anything bad to say about. I always get in trouble for doing that. I promise not to do that this morning. So the moral of the story, why I brought that up is, is let's talk about some things. Let's, let's engage people that don't believe exactly the way we do. And let's put our heads together. You've got some truth. I've got some truth. Let's put it together. Praise the Lord. Anything wrong with that? So let's go back to our man-worshiping cruise mate. She was the servant of a famous TV preacher. <laughs> she was serving somebody. And, um, well, she was a talker. Let me tell you, it was interesting. I think we finished our food completely before she had even started working on hers. And she was running all things apostolic right into the ground. I mean, she was just killing it. And finally, I guess she got out of breath and decided to let us participate in the conversation. And she said, well, what are y'all? And Lauren and I just look at each other and say, we're apostolic. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of weird. So Lauren quickly changed the subject back to her um, motivational speaker, and she talked about how he avoided certain topics in the Bible, like, oh, sin, for example. And, you know, this did not bother this woman at all. It didn't faze her. All the stuff, anything we said, and we're not, you know, bashing this brother. He has a lot of nice things to say. But if you don't talk about sin, what are you, what are you talking about? So this didn't bother the girl, like I said, because somebody had given her a DVD or she read a book and she was down in the dumps. And she said, you know, people don't want to hear about all that negative stuff when they come to church. This guy, he always says things that build me up. Now she was happy, loving the Lord and celebrating her liberty in Christ on a cruise with a man she was not married to going to the Cayman Islands. Praise the Lord. It didn't matter to her that the preacher did not preach the Bible. She said, he makes me feel good, and he gives me hope, and that's what she needed. What she really needed was a man of God with a backbone to tell her that fornication will send you to the lake of fire. You need to repent. That is what she needs to hear. 
So I told you that story to say this. You see, she had it in her mind that things were a certain way, that when the gospel message was presented, it was supposed to sound like this or look like this, and the facts didn't matter anymore. And let me tell you, that is a terrible and a very, very dangerous place to be, and we should all pray every day, God, don't let me get hard-headed. Don't let me get closed-minded or or hard-hearted so that you can't speak to me. Amen? Amen? So some of the Jewish people today are that way when it comes to our Messiah. I bet you've never heard this before, but Isaiah 53, that passage we just read, they, they consistently, always, they skip that chapter. I read something every weekend. I read the Torah portion. It's, it's the Bible divided up so that you can read it in a year. And strangely enough, if you follow the Orthodox Judaism, if you follow their plan, they conveniently skip right over Isaiah 53 because they can't explain it. So they just skip it. You know... Many Jews are just like many Christians. They don't read the Bible at home, and they don't know anything about it except what their rabbi or their pastor tells them on the Sabbath or Sunday. God help us all. This is the problem I want to speak about today. And, uh, yeah, the, uh, the thanks you get for giving me all that wonderful stuff at the shower on Wednesday is, is me preaching this kind of mess to you. You cannot have your present back, so do not ask. <laughs> So I want you to know that this attitude of things having to be a certain way, it will cause the Jew and the Christian alike to sleep right through the first resurrection, and you'll be raised up to a resurrection of judgment. Now, I have a target audience for this message today, as Pastor already alluded to, and it comes from verse 8 in my text. So uh, go back to Isaiah 53, 8, please. Let's read that again. It says, After forcible arrest and sentencing, he was taken away. And none of his generation, can you say his generation? None of his generation protested his being cut off from the land of the living. For the crimes of my people who deserve the punishment themselves, my title this morning is his generation. Who is his generation? I believe today that I'm talking to the age group of about between 13 and 40. And you'll see why I say that in just a minute. I want to talk to us. I'm in that category, so I can talk to us amen, about our responsibilities and our role in the church. I want to share some things with you today about what God expects from young people and young adults. And now, if you don't fit in that category, please don't tune me out and start playing, you know, games on your iPod or whatever, because a lot of you have, you know, children in that age group that aren't here today, and I hope you'll relay some of this message to them. I posted on Facebook that I was going to share this this morning, and some friends I have through the AWCF from other states were posting, and they they posted some frustrations about how they feel like they can't, uh, they don't have the opportunity to operate in their church because they're just being held down. They don't don't get the chance to do that. Well, I I hope if you know anybody who doesn't have the opportunity to minister and, and work in the gifts and the callings that they have, or they don't know that they should be, then I hope you'll, you'll share this message with them. So since I fall in this category, I can freely speak about this topic. But before I do, I want you to think for just a second about all the folks in the congregation who are over the age of 40 and what all they do for this assembly. The truth is, without you folks, this church would, would cease to exist. It would be over. Is that true, Pastor? Uh, several of the musicians and singers we have are over 40. We've got people on the praise team. We have uh, at least the men on our board, I think, are over 40. I can't speak to the women. Amen. In fact, a very large part of the strength and the core of this church here is the over 40 crowd. God bless you. Thank God for you and everything that you've done. Amen. You deserve an applause. Praise God. I told... Uh, I told Brother Matthew, a couple weeks ago, we had a, um, I I can't remember now if it was a prayer service or or pastor preached and gave an altar call, but when the altar was opened up, I'm pretty sure I was sitting in front of Matthew, and he beat everybody else to the front, and he kneeled down right in front of the altar and and kneeled in the floor and started praising and worshiping his guts out. I got up here beside of him in this spot, and I prayed and worshiped for a while, and Matthew, he was just tearing it up, and I'll be honest, I stopped praying and just started listening to him. And I was just getting blessed off of what he said. Praise God for inspirations like Matthew. I love you, sir. Amen. I told him when we were done that he was way too old to be doing that, and I'm so glad that he still is. 
Amen. But I have a question for all of us. I want you to think about that. Do, do you recognize there is a generational gap between myself and Brother Matthew? We probably don't listen to the same music on the radio. We may not like certain things. Uh, there is a gap between myself and, and Brother Matthew, and there's a gap between myself and the teenagers that are here today. Some of the more seasoned saints may not like the same kind of music. You talk about doing things differently. When, when we were dating, Lauren and I, when I was 17, every weeknight, when I got home, before I went to bed, I grabbed my, my cordless phone because, you know, cell phones were, they looked like Game Boys back then. <laughs> so we grabbed a cordless phone and we would talk about nothing for hours. And I know a lot of y'all can relate to this. We would talk until one of two or three things happened. Number one, Lauren would just fall asleep in the middle of me talking. That was usually the case because I did all the talking. Uh, or I would fall asleep or one of our phones would die. That was basically what ended the conversation. Uh, today, I mean, some of these young couples, they don't even hear each other's voice. They text each other, and then they, they text each other and say, I love you, baby, and then they go back to surfing Pinterest or playing Xbox. And they don't even talk to each other. Kids today, when they go to school, they get supplied a, a, a taxpayer-funded Apple MacBook Air. That is stupid. <laughs> when, I, when I was in school, I was thrilled to death when mom took me to Kmart and I got a new Trapper Keeper. Half of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> there are some differences in generations. We don't do it the way you used to do it, and some of y'all don't do it the way I do it. But here's what I see happening, back on a serious note. My mom and dad and, and Terry and Sandra and folks like y'all, when, when you guys were in your 20s, y'all picked this thing up and started running with it. You put your hands to the plow and you didn't look back. You realized what you were called to do, and you made this thing happen. When you guys were in that age bracket, the 13 to 40 in that realm, when you were his generation, you guys are pulling your weight, taking care of business. But now, the generation behind you guys, some of us, we don't share all of your values. The new his generation, and when I say that, I'm talking about the age group of Yeshua and the disciples that were around him. That's why I say that. We don't mind forsaking the assembling of ourselves together like you would have. And some of you have children that are in that, in that age bracket, that window, who only come to church when they feel like it or only come to church if they don't have something else going on. Today, his generation doesn't show up for Wednesday night services. His generation can't be counted on to show up when they say they will. Why? Because they know somebody else will take care of it. They know somebody else will cover for me. And I really need to be honest this morning because the truth is, us, we are in danger. We're in a bad way. His generation might come to the Bible study, but they didn't study for the Bible study. The scripture says that none of his generation protested. That's our problem. We just don't care. Now, I might never get to the opportunity to speak again, as Jamie used to say all the time. But I, I feel the need to just be blunt. Can I just be blunt for a minute? I'm not your pastor, and he didn't approve my notes, so if you don't like it, take it out on me. I'm taking it out on pastor. When I was in high school, I played tennis. I enjoyed it, and thankfully, we've kind of resurrected that lately, and I've enjoyed it again. And I quickly discovered when I was playing tennis that a lot of our practices and a lot of our matches ended up being on Wednesday. So I had to choose between coming to the house of God, worshiping with my friends and family, and learning the word of God, or playing tennis. Now, um, I think I got to be a, a decent tennis player. I only ever played the lowest position uh, in school because that was kind of unfair if you're playing the lowest position and you're beating people. That's kind of cheating, I guess. But anyway, uh, Parkland's biggest rival when I was in high school was Glenn, where Pastor went. And I couldn't wait for the day that Parkland got to play Glenn in tennis. And it was really cool because that day we didn't have enough players show up for Parkland. I don't know if they were scared or what. But uh, I usually play number, five, uh, number six. That's how it goes in tennis. Well, that day me and the number five guy got shifted up to play number three and number four. And they were definitely better than we were. But my friend uh, and uh, Josh in the back, you probably remember Brent Wapham. My buddy, a tall guy, I put him on the net because his reach was insane, and I would play in the back, and I'm telling you, we just crushed 
these guys. I mean, that we made them mad. I think they were cussing and stuff because we were just killing them. It felt so good. Praise God. We whipped them. And I mean, I, I didn't play sports when I was a kid, so this was a new experience for me. The next day, you know, it was in the sports section, probably in, in about, you know, a section this big. But to me, it was on the headlines. Greg Widener single-handedly destroys Glenn, smites their ruins upon the mountainside. I was so happy about that. That was a beautiful thing. And can I tell you, as awesome as that was, that did not last very long for me. Even as a 16-year-old kid, I knew that coming to church was way more important than playing sports. Conviction got on me, and it wasn't, it wasn't my parents that did it to me. I loved God, and I read his word. Even though I loved playing tennis, I could not continue disobeying Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And I think it's always good to be reminded of this New Testament commandment. So let's read this. I mean, Hebrews 10, 24. Scripture says, Let us keep paying attention to one another in order to spur each other on to love and good deeds. Verse 25. This is a commandment in the New Testament. Not neglecting our own congregational meetings as some have made a practice of doing, but rather encouraging each other and let us do this all the more as you see the day approaching. Is that hard to understand? That's not cryptic at all. The New Testament, the New Testament tells us that we should be coming to our own congregational meetings more and more the closer we get to the day of judgment and we're doing just the opposite. Instead, his generation are the ones who've made a practice of doing just that. The scripture doesn't say don't neglect your congregational meetings if you have something else going on or you've made plans already. It says don't do it. That's not Greg. That's God. That's the other G, the big G. <laughs> so I've got a word of exhortation for his generation tonight. And you know, to exhort does not mean to preach fluffy stuff that makes you feel good. The definition of a word of exhortation is an address or communication that emphatically urges someone to do something. And that is exactly what I want to happen today. If you are his generation, I've come to tell you it is time to do something. I've come to tell you today that this church should not be carried on the shoulders of grandmothers and grandfathers. The primary responsibility for this work should be supported by us, and I am going to prove it to you. That's not to say we don't need the elders. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying it's time for his generation to wake up and do their part. To just quote our pastor, it is time to rise up and build. That's what we've been hearing week after week. Here's something for you to ponder. How old do you believe the hardest workers in the church should be? What's that age group? What example, if any, does the Bible give us? What age group carried the gospel around the world? Let's see what the scripture says. Look at Luke 3.23. The Bible says that Yeshua was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. Now we know that Yeshua called Emmanuel. That means God with us. The word of God manifested in the flesh. He came into the world when the fullness of time had come. He stood in the beginning. He declared the end. God incarnate. He could have revealed himself at any point in history at any age. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. Why then did Yeshua wait until he was 30 years old to start his ministry? Why didn't he wait till he was a little bit more knowledgeable, a little more seasoned? Why not 40, 45, or 50? No, the Savior of the world was a young man. He was surrounded by Torah teachers and Pharisees much older than him. Have you ever considered the possibility that maybe he would have got a little more respect if he had a little more gray in his beard? Let's look at another scripture. 2 Samuel 5 and 4 says David was 30 years old when he began his rule and he ruled for 40 years. David, he was the one king that every other good king was compared to. He was a young man when he ruled over Israel. So what am I saying? Am I saying that you need to be 30 years old before you start your ministry? Not at all. I'm going to say something very much different from that. What if I told you that God chose a young leader to lead a band of much younger men? The truth is, if you've never heard this before, check it out. Don't take anything I say at face value. Validate it with the word of God and the culture of the day. In the culture of the day, the minimum age a person could begin ministry as a rabbi was 30 years old. You could not be 29 years old and be a rabbi. 
Check it out for yourself. If the culture had permitted, Yeshua may not have even waited that long. How many know that God will only work in what area you allow him to work in? We all have the power to put God in a box if we want to. God will only do what we allow him. God is a gentleman. I love that God is like that. He deals with the Pharisees a certain way, and he deals with the Sadducees a certain way, and he deals with me and you a different way. Whatever God, whatever we will allow, that's how God will deal, us, deal with us. So what if the 12 apostles were just kids by people's standards? When I was younger, you know, and I thought about the apostles walking around with Jesus, I pictured 45-year-old men with Duck Dynasty class beards. That's just the image I had in my head. Y'all laugh, y'all thought the same thing. Some of you are thinking, uh, that is what the apostles look like? Well, I want you to open your mind today and just postulate with me, consider the possibility that the disciples may have been 18 years old, maybe even younger than that. Exodus 30 and 13, here comes some evidence. Exodus 30, 13 tells us that every male over 20 years old is supposed to pay a half shekel for the temple tax. Now, you may remember a story in the New Testament in Matthew 17, 24. The Bible says that the tax collectors came to Peter, and they said, how come you and your rabbi aren't paying the temple tax? Remember what Yeshua told him to do? He said, go fishing. You'll catch a fish. You'll find a coin in his mouth, and that'll be enough for, to pay for me and thee, right? Everybody remembers that story? Why is there no mention of the other apostles? Didn't they always hang out together? Is it possible then that the other apostles were all below 20 years old? It's possible. Scripture doesn't say that. There's a lot more evidence. We also know that Peter was married, but there is no mention of other, any of the other apostles having wives. And also another fact you need to know from the culture of the day, in temple times when a man turned 18, it was time to settle down, start a family, get married, get a job. That was, you're grown when you're 13. Everybody heard of a bar mitzvah and a bat mitzvah? That means that's where we get the whole age of accountability thing. It comes from that. And uh, in the Jewish culture, the Hebrew culture, when you were 13, you were a man, baby. It's time to get to work. <laughs> Isn't it odd then that Peter, the only apostle that we can prove was over 20 years old because of the temple tax, is the only one that's mentioned as having a wife. It doesn't mean the other apostles weren't married. It just adds to the possibility. According to the Mishnah, and the Mishnah is uh, it's a Hebrew commentary on the Old Testament. It fills in some of the gaps in some of the stories. According to the Mishnah, scriptural study would begin for a young man when he turned five years old. I don't think you're a young man when you're five boys. <laughs> when you're five years old, you would begin learning the Word of God. And you learn the Word of God up until you turn 15. Once you were 15 years old, you, you had a, a decision to make. If your parents were rich enough or you were a bright enough student in the Bible, then you would get picked up by a rabbi and you would train to become a rabbi yourself. If that wasn't your thing, then you would begin training. Well, you'd been training with your father, but you would take on a job and work with your dad. Just like we know that, uh, you know, in all the movies you see, Yeshua working on carpentry just like Joseph taught him to, right? Um, think about the disciples. Now, this is encouraging to me. Yeshua did not pull a single one of them out of a synagogue. And the truth is, if these guys were 16 years or up, they would have been teamed up with a rabbi if they were deemed, you know, preacher stuff. If they were preacher class citizens, then they would have been picked up from a rabbi. Aren't you glad that God chose tax collectors and fishermen? You, you don't need to be a theologian to serve God. You don't have to have all the mysteries of the universe figured out. I was having dinner with my in-laws last night and Sandra asked me a question about something. I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> there are things that I do not understand yet and praise God that he still accepts me. Amen. Amen. He found James and John on a fishing boat with their dad, Zebedee. They left their occupation and they joined to Yeshua. Now think about this. According to the culture, it makes a lot more sense for these guys to have just been young men. Maybe teenagers who didn't have the money to get picked up by a rabbi. They were learning their trade from their father, like I said, just like Yeshua would have learned from Joseph. What if these were young bucks? They were not tied down. They didn't have a wife at home. They didn't have any mouths to feed. They were free to roam the world with the Messiah and go conquer the world. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't remember reading anywhere in the, the culture or in the Bible that there was such thing as welfare or food stamps in the first century. Uh, back in those days, the man of the house was a man and took care of his family. Well, I'm preaching now. <laughs> 
Look up information if you get really bored and don't believe me. Look up information about fishing in the first century. Uh, when I think of fishing, I think of a couple old guys wearing hats, you know, fly fishing. Well, these guys were fishing for their, their income. They were throwing nets out that were 300 feet wide and 12 feet tall, and they didn't know what uh, they didn't know how to spell synthetic, let alone what that was. Their nets were made out of heavy material. Uh, fishing was not a leisurely activity for retirees in that day. This was a young man's game. It makes more sense that Zebedee was probably the brains of the operation, and James and John were the brawn. Does it just make sense? I mean, it does. Think about some of the other scenarios in the New Testament, and think back to your high school weightlifting days. Multiple times in the Gospels, multiple times, Yeshua catches the apostles arguing amongst themselves, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? Does that sound like a bunch of mature men? Or does it sound like, somebody said amen. <laughs> somebody elbow your husband right now. It sounds to me like a bunch of cocky, testosterone-filled boys. It reminds me of high school days. You know, I can bench press more than you, that kind of thing, right? I can see... Um, <laughs> I could see this. You know, I can bench press more than you can, Philip. So what? I cast 20 demons out of a Samaritan woman yesterday, Bartholomew. What? That's why you don't read anything about Bartholomew, because he had a bad attitude. I used to do stuff like that when I, was, when I was in high school. You know, I bragged about how much I could, you yeah, know, right. How many stupid competitions did we do, Travis and Aaron, when we were kids? We were constantly trying to one-up each other. And you know what? Thank God, by the time you hit your 20s, you realize that it's better not to try a double backflip off of the diving board because it's better to lose face with your friends than it is to slap your face on the water. <laughs> Praise God that we mature and learn over time. Hallelujah. Another scenario for you. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, Zebedee's wife shows up with her two boys, James and John. She comes up and she says, Yeshua, can, can one of my boys sit on your right hand and, and the other on your, your left in the kingdom? I want you to think about that. Do you honestly think any self-respecting 30-year-old man would want his mommy to come to work with him and ask his boss for a raise? Or come to church and ask the pastor, can, can, can Greg preach on Sunday, please, Pastor Travis? What man is going to allow that to happen? And, and notice the response of the other disciples. If, if, I saw, you know, if I saw that situation where you know, Eugenia came to church and was asking if Aaron could lead worship, I would be laughing my head off at Aaron for allowing that to happen. But the other disciples, they didn't laugh. They get mad and they start thinking, well, I'm going to call my mom. That, what a weird response. They got angry. It's what the Bible says. It makes sense that these guys were a bunch of kids. Picture the boat out in the storm. The disciples are freaking out. They're scared for their life. They're running around, waving their hands in there. We're going to die. We're going to die. What did they do? They got the oldest guy on the boat, probably. They grabbed Jesus and said, save us, we're dying. Now, I think of that scenario, and, and I plug in, say, Greg and Dad and Terry and Steve. They're on the boat. The boat's, you know, sinking. I can see Steve running and grabbing the mast and Greg pulling up an anchor or something like that. I would see men doing something, not running around screaming. It just makes sense. And here is the kicker. This, this verse is probably the best evidence that, that I can find anyway. And it's Matthew 10, 42. This is Yeshua speaking. He says, Indeed, if someone gives just a cup of cold water to one of these little ones... Because he is my Talmud, that's a disciple, yes, I tell you, he will certainly not lose his reward. How old were the disciples if Yeshua referred to them as these little ones? History tells us, as uh, Tracy delivered in my, my teaser trailer last week, history tells us that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation in the year 90 A.D. That is 60 years after he walked with Christ. If John was only 20 years old, when he was walking with Christ, that means he was 80 when he wrote the book of Revelation. How long do you think people lived in the first century? How long must John have been when he laid his chest on Jesus, uh, when he laid on Jesus' chest and he asked him, you know, Lord, who's going to betray you? We never read about any of the apostles having children of their own. And the culture of the day says as soon as you turned 18, it was time to start reproducing, spawning, praise the Lord. For me... There is plenty of evidence to support the belief that the apostles were young, maybe even very young. And guess what? Yeshua handpicked every one of them. 
even while they were young. In fact, it looks to me, and I believe Scripture teaches, that Peter was probably the oldest in the group because he was kind of the second man in charge. You kind of get that vibe when you read the Gospels. So thinking about that, if, you've, if you ever think or you ever hear anybody else say anything about our pastor being too young or too inexperienced, then maybe you wouldn't have picked Peter to preach Acts 2.38 on the day of Pentecost. How might that have turned out? In reality, Travis is probably the same age as Peter. He might be even a little older than he was. You may also recall that Paul left Timothy in charge of the church of Ephesus. And when Paul moved on to, to continue preaching, he gave him some advice. Did, did Paul leave a young man in charge of a church? Let's look at 1 Timothy 4.12. It says, Don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth. On the contrary, set the believers an example in your speech, behavior, love, trust, and purity. What about the prophet Jeremiah? The list goes on. Jeremiah 1, 5, and 6. God speaking. He says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I separated you for myself. I have appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. And look at his response. I said, O oh, Yahweh Eloheinu, O oh, Lord God, I don't even know how to speak. I'm just a child. Jeremiah was just a child. What about the prophet Samuel? In Samuel chapter 1 verse 3, uh, or excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 3, a little boy hears God speaking to him when he lays in the bed and he gets up and he runs to Eli and he says, did you call me? Just a baby. We, we read the story about the three Hebrew boys. We don't call them the three Hebrew burly men. I think there's a reason for that. We even read that Yeshua was debating religion in the temple when he was 12 years old. Josiah sat on the king on, in the throne of Judah when he was only eight. Now, some people, they hear that and they say, well, he was eight years old. He, he got that because his daddy died. Uh, and he was just the next in line. It had nothing to do with him being young. Well, the Bible says that when he turned 16 years old, it says his heart turned to the God of his father David. And before he was 20 years old, Josiah was running all over the land, tearing idols down, doing the work of God, even as a young man. The youth in Scripture that Yahweh used were not limited to boys either. I want to make this crystal clear. How old do you think Hadassah was? Hadassah sounds nothing like Esther. I don't know how they screwed that up. Uh, when she saved the entire nation, one little girl, one young lady saved the whole country. She is more important than half the other people in the Bible. True story. She was a young virgin girl. She might have even been the best looking girl in the land. You better believe she must have been young because if she wasn't, somebody else would have married her already. Why was she still available? How old was the virgin Mary? when God decided that she was ready and qualified to give birth to the Savior. Now, not that I'm advocating this for today, but experts say she was probably 14 or 16 years old and not likely any older than that. Wow. So what is my point in all of this? My point is that his generation has always been right in the very forefront when they were in God's will. God chose a young woman to create a body for him to start his earthly ministry. And he went around and handpicked people that today people would say, they're too young to be the pastor. They're, too, they're not qualified for this. They don't have enough experience. Well, Yeshua would disagree with you. He handpicked young people, maybe even a bunch of teenagers. So like the scripture says, while the majority of his generation didn't care about his death, like Isaiah 53 said, there were a group of young people who followed him. And not only that, think about this. The bunch in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, that could have been mistaken for a youth prayer meeting, a Friday night prayer service for the kids. So Tamaris, my brother, props to you, man. You're preaching the gospel and you're just a young man. I honor you. God has established numerous examples through the Old Testament and the, and the New that he wants young people active. It's all over the Bible. Just as Paul told Timothy, I'll tell you, Tamaris, and any other, anybody else in here with a calling on your life, let no man despise your youth. God called you. It doesn't matter what man says. I believe that it is not God's will, based on the examples in Scripture, that the 20-somethings sit back and expect the 40 and the 50-year-olds to do everything. It's time that we all roll up our sleeves and get to work. 
and not just the 20-somethings either. The evidence suggests that John, who wrote the book of Revelation, he was probably 14 years old. That is the most prominent belief when you look it up. 14 years old when he followed Yeshua around. You have everything going for you. I mentioned at the beginning of service that I got a, some feedback on Facebook where a guy said, well, I want to do stuff in my church, but I feel, like, I feel like the older generation won't let me. And that's so sad. But you know what? All I can talk to is, is us here, and you have everything going for you here. You have a young pastor that wants to see the young people active. You have a young first lady who's a godly example and is getting the salt shakers together. We don't have any excuse. We have everything going for us. We got Aaron, who's still a spring chicken, leading the praise team. Thank God for the youthful talent of guys like Blake and Nick and, and others who are doing stuff, putting their talents to work for God. You got Tiffany getting the uh, you know, vacation Bible school together. We got all kinds of young people working in here. And, and just because I didn't say your name, please don't think I don't mean you're not working. Uh, I appreciate what Sister Tracy said, calling everybody out. We got a lot of hard workers in this church. God bless all of you. What I will say on the flip side of that, is there are a good number of teenagers and 20-somethings who don't contribute like they could be. Based on all the evidence I've displayed for you today, I believe it is safe to say that God expects you, not just wants you, but God expects you to be working in a greater capacity than you are. And I know Tracy already preached part of my sermon here, but I want to make something very clear again. You do not have to be on the platform to be important. What if, what if, what if young men and young women in this congregation would just come and sit together on the first four rows every service? What if you did that? What kind of impact do you think you would have if you sat on these first four rows and during singing you lift, you lift your hands in the air, you open your mouth, you close your eyes, and you worship God? I'm going to ask the congregation a question. Those of you who are not in that age window, do you believe that if the young people of this church did that, that it would not have more of an impact than Aaron or Steve or Allison getting up here and leading the most powerful song that we have? Do you believe the young people would have more of an impact? Worshiping, praising God. Absolutely. That, that would be more effective than anything else we can do. Praise God. Pastor, do you agree with that? We're in one accord. We're all, we're all pulling for you to get this, to make this happen. A good place to start. If, if you're feeling this, if you're, if you're seeing the evidence, if you're getting the revelation, then I want to tell you a good place for you to start is to come to church faithfully. That's a great start. How, what can I do for God? Come to church participate in the service sit in the front and be a praise leader you don't have to be on stage to be a praise leader amen praise God be faithful to your assembly stand up lift your hands sing the songs and be amazed at the effect you have on, on your fellow believers uh, when, I, when I was real young, I remember we would, go to, uh, we would go to these youth services all the time. David Brown would take us everywhere. We'd go to these services, and I would be so excited. I would, I would specifically position myself. Janice, I would get as close as I could to Josh Elks. I loved sitting beside Josh. Josh is bananas. That dude's just crazy anyway. We would get in service, man. Even though he was probably going to hurt me at some point shouting, <laughs> he would pump me up so much, man. I'd just be like, yeah, let's get crazy. I'm telling you, it's amazing when you surround yourself with other people your age who are worshiping like you are. That's how you fulfill that scripture that says provoke one another to good works. That's how you drive each other up in worship. And that probably, it can happen, but it's less likely if we're scattered all over and sitting in the back. It's just true. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12 and 1, Remember your creator while you are young. Before the evil days come and the years approach when you will say, they no longer give me pleasure. Can you stand with me, please? Thank you. In closing, I want to ask a question. Which member of his generation will you be? Will you be the ones the Bible speaks of, the majority who the Bible says they just didn't care? The ones who did not make a relationship with God or working in the kingdom their priority? His generation are the ones who didn't pay him any attention. That was the majority, but those of his generation who did, they were the closest ones. They were his inner circle. Think about that. The youngest people were the closest to Yeshua. 
I hope you'll share this message, uh, this message with someone else. I, I pray that you'll encourage somebody to hear this. I, you know, my goal in this, I want you to be inspired. I want you to feel important. I want you to feel a responsibility for the things of God. God chose young people to be in the front, not in the back, not hiding in the back. He chose young people to carry the gospel to the world. Not sit back and wait for the adults to do it. That's not what God's will is for you. Does he want you skipping church on Wednesday, young person? Does he want you to come to church on Sunday and, as Pastor Travis says, be a bump on a pickle? Is that God's will? I'm going to close this and try to do something different today. Um, I, I, want to see, I want to see people make a decision. Not, not something, I don't want to play uh, any sappy music and try to solicit an emotional response from you today. I want you to make a decision with your head this morning, if you're willing. I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to put you on the spot. You can get mad at me if you want to. I'm going to ask everybody who's 40 years and older, you guys can go ahead and sit back down. I just want his generation to be left standing. I want to take a look and see what it looks like. Take a look around. That might be the majority. We're looking at an army in this house. There might be 70 people here that could go tear the devil's kingdom down. If we would just get involved. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Praise God. I, I didn't realize there were this many people that, that fit that category. That's beautiful. We should be able to build this church in like five minutes. <laughs> so I want to ask you today. Now, listen to what I'm saying. With no music playing, every head raised and every eye open. Different. If you recognize if you get the revelation of what I have declared from you from the word of God if you see that God has called you and me to make this thing happen then I want to ask you to come to the front if you're willing to work now if you're not willing to work don't come don't lie do not come up here if you're not serious but if you are serious and you want to serve God you recognize that he has called his generation to take the gospel to the world then please come to the front this is the altar call for today I want a decision from your head. You're not obligated to come up here. This is your decision. And I'm liking what I'm seeing. Praise God. The rest of you, if you don't want to come, you're free to sit. In fact, the rest of you, go ahead and take a break. Take a break. Let's, let's let the church, y'all come on up. Let's fill in and get as close as we can because I'm getting ready to mix you up. Uh, I want to do something that... Uh, we did many. We, we did lots of time years ago when we were young. We, we'd go over to Sister Tracy's house and we'd have prayer. And I found something to be pretty powerful. I want to ask, uh, and I'm sorry that we're so crowded. No, I'm not sorry at all that we're so crowded. I'm happy we're crowded. Praise the Lord. I want to ask all the guys to come over here, all the brothers on the left and all the ladies on my right, please. Guys over on this side, ladies over here. And I want to ask you to circle up. If you can, if you got kids with you, that's no problem. Ask you to circle up, join hands, brothers, pray in a huddle, whatever you're comfortable doing. But I want everybody to join hands. What I want to do today, us young people, is, is let's pray for each other. Take a look around. Take a look at the people you're standing here with. You, we, we're his generation. We're the people that God called. Now, all the rest of you in the audience, you are totally valuable and important. I don't want to you know, send the wrong message at all. But these are the people that are supposed to be shouldering the work. It's what the scripture says. So I want us to pray with each other. And I want us to ask God to help the person next to you to do what God has called us to do. I want you to pray and worship. Can we lift up a praise without music? Can we do it? Can we just show God that we're excited, that we're willing to work? Everybody just open your mouth. Let's just pray. Let's just worship God. God, thank you. For all these people that have come, God, your generation, the people that you've called to carry this gospel to the world, God, I pray you'll set us on fire, each and every one of us, God, as we lift up our voices, as we worship and praise you, God, because we are not ashamed. We are not ashamed of your gospel. We're not ashamed to stand for you, to take the gospel to our workplaces, in our homes. I've got men to my left that are going to be priests in their home. They're going to raise their children according to the word of God. I've got women on my right who are going to go to school and share the gospel with their friends. 
Girls that are going to take the, take the word to their job. God, I just pray, let your anointing rest on everybody that is in this altar. Oh, God, set this group of young people on fire. God, I pray for a transformation today. Lord, I pray that you will put it in our hearts. We have too many people here not to fill up the first four rows in this church. I pray, God, that you'll put a burden in their hearts to come to the front every service and lead praise and worship. God, set us on fire. Just as the song said, you are welcome here. You are welcome here in these young people in the hearts and minds of my brothers and sisters this morning, God. Set every one of us on fire. Give us a burden for the lost to take the gospel to the world. Glory, glory, hallelujah. God, I pray that you'll pour your Holy Ghost power out on every person that's in this altar, God. Set us ablaze for your glory. Praise God, hallelujah. You in the audience, I see you're out praying. Y'all come on up now. Men, get over here and lay hands on the men. Ladies, come up and pray with the ladies over here. Put your hands on them and pray. You that have been working for such a long time in the kingdom, impart something to us, to our generation. Show your support. Just go on around and pray with everybody. God, we give you glory. You are worthy. You are holy. I'm going to put this mic down. Let's just lift up a praise. Hallelujah. God is worthy.